everyone. Uh, we wanted to take this occasion to talk about uh, addiction as a mental health issue and how Indian law sees it. So, uh, for this conversation, we have with us uh, our resident expert uh, Neha Singhal, uh, senior resident fellow at uh, Vidhi Center for Legal Policy, who leads the criminal justice team and has been extensively working in the area of uh, drug laws and reform. So, welcome, Neha. Hi. Thank you. So I'm uh, just going to start by uh, telling you about the reason why we picked this particular topic uh, for today. It was basically uh, to steer the conversation that's going on about uh, drugs and the laws around it, its use and abuse, to uh, which, which is happening in the news right now, to a much more constructive direction where we not only see uh, criminalization of drugs, but also uh, how addiction is treated under the law and the legal system as a whole. So it uh, comes under the mental health care addiction as uh, comes under the Mental Health Care Act of uh, 2017 and also under the NDPS Act. Uh, that's the Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Act that deals with uh, drug regulation. Uh, I'm going to give it to Neha to like basically start the conversation from here on how both of these laws individually look at addiction. Okay. Hi. So um, I'll start with, uh, since you've talked about addiction being a part of both laws, I'll talk about how these two laws address addiction in terms of the definition. So uh, NDPS defines an addict as a person who has dependence on any narcotic drug or psychotropic substance. Um, this definition was uh, changed in 2001. I'll come to that later, but I just want to fly that this was, an, this was a, um, a definition made in 2001. The Mental Health Care Act may, uh, scores, defines mental illness as inter alia mental conditions associated with the abuse of alcohol and drugs. Mm -hmm. So all act Mental Health Care Act actually talks about is any sort of mental conditions associated with uh, use yeah. of alcohol and drugs. One, it doesn't distinguish between alcohol and drugs. It doesn't make a distinction between these two categories. Two, it doesn't tell you what those mental conditions are. Those are meant to be in accordance with international and national norms. The international norm on this right now is something called the International Classification of Diseases, which basically talks about drug dependence, which says that drug dependence is a mental and behavioral disorder associated with alcohol or drug abuse. So that's how you get this dependence, this ca common category of drug dependence in both NDPS and in Mental Health Care Act, even though the Mental Health Care Act doesn't talk about addiction per yeah. se. But it's the way it has been defined. Now, addiction or addict has been defined in 2001 under the, men mental, uh, under, under the NDPS Act as dependence. Before this, interestingly, it used to call addict, an addict is anybody who has addiction to drugs. Basically. Okay. So that is how until 2001 addiction or addict was defined under the NDPS Act. Mm -hmm. So this is how the two laws define uh, addiction or deal with addiction. What is primarily different between these two laws would be the objects and reasons of the two laws. So I'll just read out the objects and reasons and maybe that will be clear just on the face of it. So the Mental Health Care Act says that the, the objects and reasons say that it's to provide for mental health care and to protect, promote the rights of persons with mental illnesses. Okay, so this is like a, it's a very rights-based approach where people suffering from mental illnesses and the process that they have to go through while they are in treatment and care has been known to be so traumatic. And so in, it infringes people's rights so much that this act is supposed to sort of give the person or the, the uh, person suffering from mental illnesses some power back. Okay. The NDPS Act, when it was enacted in 1985, had two primary objects and reasons. One was to strengthen the existing controls over drug abuse, so controls over drug abuse, and two, enhance penalties, particularly for trafficking. Now, this whole idea that addiction is something that should be treated separately was always a part of the NDPS Act, but very, very narrowly construed. I'll again get into the history in a bit, but what, as the law stands of today, where addiction is taken care of in the NDPS Act, still, the objects and reasons now, as they stand today, says that the act or the amendment envisages severe punishments for drug traffickers and a reformative approach towards addicts, which they mean is less punishment. Now, if you say what the conflict between these two laws is, is I think this is what I said, that this should be um, apparent on the face of it, mm -hmm. is that the NDPS Act still looks at addiction within the paradigm of criminalization, yeah. and the M Mental Health Care Act looks, gives addiction a healthcare or a rights-based approach. So the second you have, and in, in the Mental Health Care Act, uh, the only penalties that they have are for people who are running institutions without the correct licenses, licenses yeah. and registrations. No other kind of people attract penalty because 
naturally anybody who is suffering from mental illness cannot be an offender under the law so the primary difference is that there is one law which says that you need to have a more humane approach towards addiction like the way they have read mental illness and that addiction has been read into mental illness that you need to have a more humane approach towards this another one says that yes addicts are a victim of circumstances and we do want to provide for them but that is still done within the paradigm of making them offenders mm-hmm. so that language doesn't change now what is also very important is that so for all of its flaws and those flaws are like more legal uh, legislative drafting mental health care act has a very it sort of it gives and i want to again read these out because it makes it so evident so section 18 says that the state is responsible for ensuring inter alia amongst other things treatment in a manner that allows mentally ill people to live in their communities and with their families hmm. institutionalized is kept as a resort as a, as a last resort as a measure of last resort and if the person is required it should be so that the state should provide mental health healthcare facilities so that the person does not have to travel long distances to get mental health care treatment yeah. but this is in stark opposition to how uh, the ndp or stark difference to how the ndps act and visages uh, reformation of addicts so there are yeah. two provisions uh, under the act which specifically provide for reformation of addicts right reformation one is a problem uh, or probation of addiction uh, of addicts is a problem the terminology itself is a problem but sections 39 and 64a basically say that a person can be diverted away from the criminal justice system if he admits that he is an addict agrees to go to a de addiction center then signs a bond with the court that he will not re offend in the next 3 years otherwise the period of that sentence will be he will have to go through the period of that sentence now the issue with this is that it 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 uh, it adopts a very abstinence based approach towards addiction it looks at addiction as a moral flaw that a person has to be scolded for or reprimanded for to be able to take away from it does not it does not recognize the relapsing or recurring nature of addiction so the thing that everybody who is involved with addiction will tell you whether it's even police officers doctors of course even judges is that you will find the same people entering the system over and over and over because drug addiction is not something that goes away the first time around the 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 relapse of i think of addiction is it is like almost like it's a, i don't i remember the percentage that they had said but it was ridiculously high to some 90 whatever percent so the thing is most people will relapse over and over before they get clean so the system and the mental health care act recognizes it it says that a person should have capacity to make decisions even if for somebody else even if to somebody else that decision might seem wrong that does not take away from the person's ability to make or the capacity to make a decision so they have allowed people with mental care with sorry with mental illnesses to have the agency to make decisions regarding their own health care so this would include people with addiction as well yeah. so as long as you and it does not allow it does it does not it does not prescribe mandatory treatment because unless you are incapacitated so unlike the ndps act which uh-huh. only gives you an option of exiting the criminal justice system if you do enter a de addiction center Okay. So there is this one huge difference of saying yes you have agency we understand that there is relapse possible that mental illnesses don't go away in one whatever the kind of illness it may be it doesn't just go away and addiction itself is a very relapse heavy problem is something that the mental health care act at least seems to understand the ndps act absolutely does not it's either the jail or it's a de addiction center so the thing is as opposed to so i'm sorry i know you want to interface so i will just end <laughs> Um, yeah, as, yeah, yeah. as opposed to as opposed to the ndps act which only makes institutionalization your or institutionalization your only option the mental health care act at least in principle says it should be your last option so okay. this is hugely different but now i will stop so you can ask me no so uh, the only uh, thing that stood out from what you said was that there is an option uh, not only thing of course the, uh, so there is an option for the person to exit the system of the criminal system under ndps act but when you say an option to exit exit do you mean that person is completely exempted from uh, like the criminal process like is it like like there won't be any prosecution record or no or- no no so no 
so it's actually very badly drafted and because it's not executed at all we don't know what it's supposed to be um so section 39 basically says that if a ju- if a judge if a person before a judge says that he is in a date so mm-hmm. at the time of sentencing instead of sentencing him the person can be sent to a de addiction center after he has completed his treatment period he will sign a bond with the judge which says that he will not re- reoffend first it uses the word reoffend and this uh, the bond period can last up to 3 years okay so the thing that you're asking is now the way the section is written it only comes to comes at play at the sentencing stage which yeah. means that you have actually gone through the whole process of trial and it's only at the sentencing that that has been taken away and it also says that if you reoffend within the 3 years and if you violate the terms of that bond then you can be asked to undergo the period of sentence that was originally supposed to be your sentence That's so very uh, interesting because i didn't un- like honestly when you say exit i and when i read the ndps act before also i i understood as an exemption from prosecution altogether mm-hmm. and when you also you also mentioned that the statement of objects changed when uh, they added in looking at they changed the uh, definition of addiction and they added in looking at reforms for uh, addiction as well and you add in this so that's on one side and then you add in this provision that says that there is a way for you to exit it's not really clear as to what direction you are going into whether you are looking we are actually looking at de addiction as an issue or you're still looking at criminalization of that person only that's a very interesting so the thing is there are two things here uh, one is that section 39 was a part of the original act that wasn't amended in 2001 okay. the the not being prosecuted bit that you're saying is section 64a where the prosecutor has the the, the the response of the authority yeah this person is an addict let's send him to a de addiction center and let's not prosecute him again the issue with this is that i now you'll have to read out the section to tell you what the problem is but the issue is that this section is so poorly drafted that we don't know at what stage this person the prosecutor yeah. has the authority to do this is it before a judge is it after the trial begins is it when he when the person is just arrest, arrested and brought before the prosecutor we don't know so yeah. um, this also doesn't get utilized because the section is so poorly written nobody knows and nobody cares so um, the the two things the 2001 amendment is when the 64 no 64a happened in 1989 no so uh, the two things that you're talking about is that at the time of drafting there was or at the time that each amendment happens this thing the that addiction is a huge problem and it needs to be taken care of and we need to accommodate for that mm-hmm. within the law is very well established but the thing is that they're looking because this act is trying to also cover trafficking and sourcing and yeah. cultivation and addiction that is that addiction become even though in terms of enforcement it is the thing that they, uh, they that they focus on the most but in terms of the writing of the law it has received least amount of attention so it's there it, it there are provisions for uh, opioid substitution therapy of having centers under the ndps act registered centers the addiction centers and rehabilitation centers but these have received the least amount of attention mm-hmm. because obviously it's an enforcement heavy law so yeah. uh, the conflict is that you're trying to accommodate the addiction um within like i said the paradigm of criminalization and i also remember from one of our last slides where you told us that it actually comes under five different ministries like yes. one act using yes. five like five ministries using one act yes. to deal with trafficking to deal with the addiction yes. to deal with yes. it as a public health issue yes. Yes, it, it, and the number of agencies not. that they've included NIA. I don't even know how many agencies can actually enforce NDPS. So if the number of agencies are crazy. There is uh, NCB, CBN, yeah. uh, DRI, State Police, NIA, I, I'm uh, Customs. So it's endless. It's endless the number of people who have control over you for this over under this law. And it can be so intimidating for someone who's not in the legal system or not a lawyer, at, like has no connection to the law, to be entering. to be understanding this issue just like you know okay if i google up and i see what does the drug law say in india now i will of course be like told that this is the punishment this is the punishment this is the punishment but when you are trying to understand that okay how does like it deal with these separate issues like uh, the addiction trafficking consumption cultivation there's no like it, it's a very confusing web that you can get stuck in Oh. and for someone who's looking for um, like you know addict, like the addiction treatment it can be very it, it can be a very intimidating process so, so because this... I, i also remember reading in uh, like just around just a few months back when uh, they started taking down numbers for 
things that happened during the lockdown. I think it was the social justice ministry that had reported that in April, they have a de-addiction helpline, right? Mm, yes. In April, they received almost 5,000 calls uh, on their helpline number and it was like a 200% increase from the January, from, mm. from, like, from the numbers in January. So, I mean, and for someone say, uh, I want to go, say, I, I want to look for de-addiction options. Then I go in and I see like, I don't understand things at all like, because I, you're, there's information on trafficking, there's information on criminalization. So I think the need of a year is right now to separate all of these so that process. Yeah, so, so when I said that, you know, this thing about the Mental Health Care Act, where they say institutionaliz- institu- institutionalization is a measure of last resort and a person must not have to travel long distance. Yeah. So uh, sections, so there are two sections under the NDPS Act or actually one section under the NDPS mm-hmm. Act, Section 71, which provides for the addictions, uh, like how, how the addiction centers are supposed to be done, or that there are the addiction centers, it's under Section 71. So mm-hmm. uh, state governments are required to make rules for establishment, appointment, maintenance of centers for the addiction treatment of any other, whatever form. And the second part, which is very interesting, which says that addicts registered under the state government, with the state government, sorry, can be supplied drugs for treatment and medical care. Now, this is very interesting to me because now I don't know how it works in reality because there is no way for us, for an addict to be registered with the state government. There is just no way for this to happen. Oh, okay. How are you going to, what, are you going to go to the high government and say, I'm an addict, register me? What is this register? I don't know of any such register. All I think that is happening in practice then is that there are some, there are some centers like NDDTC of AIMS, which is, uh, which is legally allowed to prescribe OSD, which is opioid substitution therapy, mm-hmm. um, which is what you need at the detoxification stage. Yes. Right? Like, or I think, no, the detoxification stages, withdrawal, whatever it is required at one of the healing stages. Mm-hmm. Yes. So the thing is that because such few centers have it, people have to travel from across like if you will have people coming from Bihar just to come to Delhi for this OSD. Yes, same way there are like two hospitals in Bombay and all of Maharashtra has to come to these two hospitals in Bombay for their OSD. So this thing this is what I'm saying this is my issue with making something a crim- having a criminalized lens at a problem as opposed to a rights-based lens mm-hmm. is because whether it gets done in practice or not, the law has now said that it is important for institutionalization to not be a go-to. It is important that a person stay close to his community and family because whatever healing of mental illness is needed will be better done amongst friends than in some center. Or, or that a person who is suffering should not have to travel 500 kilometers to get one injection or one pill. Right. So the law at least is saying that because it looks at people and gives people rights. Whereas here, people deem under the NDPS Act, people demonize whether it is an addict who has made a model, who has a model failing and should be scolded, whether it is a trafficker, everything ha- is looked at a, from a lens of from a lens of wrongdoing. Right? Yeah. Whatever you may be doing, you it's a, it's wrongdoing, and nobody is truly kind to wrongdoing. So uh, this, uh, what should be done for the addiction, things like that, it's a, it's a complete mess because the law is just not kind to these people. What now is happening, this is now getting into a little bit of a nitty gritty on this, is one, NDPS only recognizes centers for the addiction. It's only centers, whereas the Mental Health Care Act looks at a variety of different services as healthcare establishments. So your yoga and they say Unani, I don't know what Unani is, but whatever. Uh, Ayurvedic center. So it basically has alternative healing that it has included within the uh, ambit of this act. What this act has done is that because now you have um, men- the, uh, addiction is will be read into mental illness, any mental Ill- mental health care establishment has to now be registered under the Mental Health Care Act. Yeah. Earlier, all these centers, NDP centers for the addiction had to be uh, registered by their state or whatever the state government rules were. That's yeah. what uh, had to, they had to comply with those uh, conditions. Now, because it has been called mental illness, they have to be registered under the Mental Health Care Act. Yeah. But this narcotic drugs and, subst- and psychotropic substances, this OST that is provided for uh, patients can only be provided if you are registered, as far as I know, I'm not 100% sure if I'm right on this, but they can only be provided if you're registered as an NDPS de-addiction center under the NDPS Act and the state rules. So now we might be in a situation where 
and under the mental health care act where they have some offenses now if you're not registered if you're running a center and you're not registered under the mental health care act you can face penalties so we might be in a situation right now where a de addiction center has to register both under the state government so they can continue providing this opioid substitution therapy yes. which is illegal otherwise and under the mental, mental health care act because if they are not they are offending under the mental health care act and the mental health care act has a non atlantic law so it's overriding of all other laws so now we are in this very bizarre conflict situation and i don't know how they are resolving it so um, this it's a great law in terms of its progressive but i don't know how they sort of uh, put all these other factors in together because ndps will not allow for some center or something registered under some other law to provide yeah. uh, opioids because they're never going to do it so i don't and it's been almost 3 3 years since 2 years since this act has been in place and i mean the conflict is being highlighted by a lot of people right what is there's this conflict that's there between these two yeah. but i think there it's being highlighted by people who are field workers as in who are you know like service providers and people yeah. activists how it takes a really long time for activists to make a dent on things some like i don't know somebody needs to die in jail or like uh, i don't know deepika padukone needs to get arrested for addiction you, you need to have uh, i'm not should be saying these things i don't even know who's listening anymore but uh, point is that you need a really high profile case for these things to move and things to change activists are going to do what will take 20 years yeah but the thing is uh... because there's been so much conversation around drug laws and how like you should go ahead and decriminalize i mean although like for a lot of people, people are calling us crazy for saying it decriminalize but you're not understanding that there are larger motivations behind decriminalization as well so you should take this opportunity to go ahead and actually talk about these conflicts and talk about how like why is there a like need for decrim like decriminalization in general to not just make use available but also to help people who are uh, tackling the addiction Oh yes, absolutely. Because uh, these centers are not able to perform effectively. Yeah. Police will come and arrest people for providing these uh, services. They have licenses and things like that, of course. But the thing is, so what happens is that there are uh, a lot of peer uh, educators or uh, you know people who are ex addicts who come and join a de addiction center, and they sometimes they'll carry like clean syringes. So uh, there is a whole concept of harm reduction. i don't know if you i'm basically saying that at least you are going to do this but at least let's make the practices safer for you yeah. so um people will be like peer educated these uh, whatever they'll be carrying uh, clean syringes and you know there are these like hubs where people go and shoot up and things like that so they'll go to these people and like bhaiya tum ye needle le lo ye wala mat use karo don't use uh, this needle that's been passed around police will come and harass them peer educators get arrested so often so sometimes if they have pills on them because they know these people are not coming and these are these people are problem addicts they're not coming let's go let's go to their homes and let's give them whatever they need there okay yeah. they won't be allowed to do this they'll get arrested on the way doctors get arrested all the time so it's not just the you're right it's not just about helping the addict it's also about helping the doctor who's helping the addict it's it's a very like it's not it's not just a very localized problem where you want to legalize like you know cannabis for your use but it's also addressing a lot of other smaller uh, issues like much more uh, cannabis is a non issue cannabis has become a big whatever cultural or has uh, taken center stage right now because it's it's so ubiquitously used and everybody is talking about it and of course cannabis was the thing of discussion with the soul yeah. but otherwise cannabis is a non issue one it grows wild there's very little anybody can do about it everybody knows two nobody really is addicted to cannabis you need to have like a very high amount of use for you to be addicted addicted to cannabis mm -hmm. so you know nobody really cares but your other harder drugs you know where addiction can happen over some two or three uses and this addiction can do in your life you become completely you become a shell of your being those are your problem drugs those are your problem addicts and those are the people the law needs to protect as opposed to demonizing them so which is what the ndps does it demonizes addiction as moral failings demonizes and also like you know generally for a person a lay person who's not associated with the law i just keep coming back to this because it there's a very paternalistic concept right from the state like you know as you said like you know it's scolding someone that oh you did this like you know you broke your bond you're going to go to prosecution again but there are these two systems in place one that criminalizes you and one that is looking to help you with addiction how am i to understand like if i go tell them that i'm a drug addict and i need help i will always have this fear that oh this but there is a bigger law that's criminalizing me yes yes of course 
absolutely so uh, you are still even so this is the central conflict that there is one law which says fine we'll help you and another law which says that just acknowledging this existence makes you a criminal so when section 27 says whoever you, whoever consumes it's not just the act of possession that you have made a criminal offense you by your existence are a criminal so like if you have ever consumed cannabis you by your existence are a criminal so uh, it's not it doesn't even like this is the great thing about um, this particular section so you know you usually make acts criminal offenses mm -hmm. right like who, who, the commission of murder is a criminal offense yes. the commission of rape is a criminal offense okay you by your existence are not a criminal okay but this has just made you like whoever consumes is a criminal offender so um, this this section is fantastic what in what it does So, uh, also on the topic of uh, uh, decriminalization, like to look at and like how the world would look on the other side of things where uh, consuming is not a crime. Uh, I mean, every time I have a conversation with someone, I become the example of Sikkim from our last conversation. Can you talk about how, uh, just very very briefly, like you know how uh, Sikkim decriminalizing consumption helped? uh addiction i know we covered this last time also but just to add on to this conversation this is how uh, the other side of things actually looks like you know because we're talking about this conflict between these two laws and then we have this example in our very country that it when you decriminalize something how it actually helps out an addict in so you know i think what i have missed in my uh, telling of the story is that i usually don't i or maybe i'm not i'm not explaining this clearly enough that sikkim we have i only been there for like four days so i you know there's only so much i can say but sikkim on the face of it seems to be a much kinder society i have ex experienced personally in the rest of the country as in it has a kinder approach to people and so the law i think is more of a telling of the society and of the governance than the other way around i think the law sort of showed you know was more of a result of look we just we aren't that these people we don't do things this way more than the law changing how people did things but what it gave people the legitimate license to do is that if the police that the police now legitimately does not arrest you know because if they know that there is a person in front of them who is an addict they have a provision in then they're not tied to arrest him which you know in other parts of, so i'll come back to this the other parts of the country is that sometimes especially with severe addiction cases is that police will admit that when they arrest a person who is an addict he might be peddling but he is like peddling to sustain his addiction habit is that they will have to procure drugs for this person in the lockup Okay. because if they don't this person might kill himself or might go crazy i have personally seen this is something i've seen and it's scary to watch i have seen a little child a 7 7 8 year old child who was an addict he used to um, sniff glue yeah. mm. so this whatever he was going through some withdrawal symptoms and he kept banging his head against the wall and if they hadn't been stopped he would have like broken his head so you know the thing is that this the police will have to provide drugs they can't help it but they're going to do it under the radar right here in sikkim because the law allows house for it they will call uh, the addiction center they will call somebody who knows how to handle this person this person will then be treated you know more humanely the family will be uh, in, the family will be called and then so the law provides for compulsory psychiatric evaluation and that is the only thing that is compulsory so the law has also recognized that compulsory institutionalization is not a solution because in a lot of jurisdictions they have gone for diversion out of the criminal justice system into compulsory institutional realization which is not a solution for addiction either so if this particular state seems to have gotten a lot of these aspects right so that means that if you are kind and you want to be kind to a person the law allows for it as opposed to your hands being tied because the law says no there is no way we will ever allow a person to ever like get a second chance at life now even um, i mean i understand that you said that sikkim is just like it they are kinder in many ways and the more i think you mentioned empathetic last time like you know they are much more uh, which is why they were able to like bring in this reform but keeping that aspect aside do you think that this can be used as an example for other states or even the center like you know 100%. because successfully managed to 
deal with it uh, like it will with- actually really help you know because i'm telling you so of course bombay is a bad example especially now with what's happened in bollywood and all of those things but i don't think the police actually wants to arrest it it's not just think about this from a human being's perspective okay even if you're not a kind person if you know that you have this addict who's going to start screaming and wailing at night and he's going to start hurting himself okay and you are like a you are a police officer who wants to like you know nap on his chair at night do you want this person on your head like it's not just you just don't want this to happen so you know it's not that they, a lot of times it's not like they they are hard pressed so if, if the police didn't have to bother with these people they're going to be more than happy and mm-hmm. these people it's not like you know so the, i think this big song and dance was also made about how you need to sometimes arrest consumers to go up the chain which is bullshit nobody the consumer does not know the trafficker it is rubbish it doesn't help so and the police also knows it yeah. so uh, this is all i watched it does not help anybody and the police are going to be more than happy doctors are going to be able to then go to a, an addict's house and help them peer educators like if i am an ex addict and you are an addict i'll actually be able to walk with you all of those things are going to become a lot easier and this is not just a sikkim thing you ask somebody in punjab if it was legalized in punjab the amount of trouble they would be saved because the only thing that has worked is the peer program they are the only thing that are actually able to make a difference so then give them the freedom to make a difference but the law doesn't allow it well i hope that this does start a larger conversation i mean um, on looking at these two laws to go side by side rather than them them conflicting conflicting yes let's let's hope that this adds to the conversation and like you know take like people to take it forward ahead and uh, thank you so much for talking to us nia it was thank very, you thank you for having me it was a very very informative chat and uh, if any of our users have any more questions for nia you can leave it under uh, this video and we will forward it to neha or, or alternate alternatively you can even leave it on the ask nia tab on our website um and uh, if you have any uh, questions specifically on the mental health care law or the ndps law we have specific explainers on the website as well do check those out and uh, thanks again neha like thank you hope that this has added uh, to the Kind of the, uh, we steered the conversation in the right direction today. Let's let's hope that it take someone like people who can go and absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye.